Good morning. Happy Easter. All right, I'm going to try that again. I think I, this, this is the sunrise service, so I understand you guys are still waking up. I, so a friend texted me yesterday and said, hey, do we have a sunrise service? I said, yeah, 9 a.m., 9 a.m. So here you are. This is as early as we get up around here at Alpine Church. We're so glad you joined us today. I'm Pastor Brian, one of the pastors here at Alpine. And All right, we're, we've, what we've been doing all, all year long so far at Alpine is we've been going through the, the book of Mark. There are four Gospels. The first four books of the New Testament are called the Gospels because they share the good news about Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is the shortest of the four. It's only 16 chapters, and we've been studying it. And we're going to continue to study it even ne- next week as we get into chapter four next week. But, but today, I'll, I'll, we're, going to, we're going to eventually make our way toward the Easter story at the end of the Gospel of Mark. But before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about a prophecy that is in Scripture that really speaks to the Easter story. Now, I don't know if you, you know this, but one of the most powerful passages of scripture comes from Psalm 22. It says, it says this, I want you to hear these words that I'm going to read. This is one of my favorite prophecies in the whole Bible because it, to me, it really shows the truth of God's plan from beginning to end. Now, this isn't, this isn't what we're studying today, but I just can't help myself. Whenever I think about prophecies in the Old Testament about Easter or about Jesus, about the death and resurrection of Jesus, Psalm 22 comes to mind. I remember as a, as a junior higher hearing this for the first time and it blew my mind and it helped me to understand that God's word is true. I want to read some of these words and, and see if this sounds familiar. It says, everyone who sees me mocks me. Does that sound like the cross? They sneer and shake their heads saying, is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. If you know the crucifixion story, that should sound familiar to you. Or how about this verse, verse 14? My life is poured out like wax, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. That's actually a pretty fitting description of what would happen to a person hanging on a cross Verse 16, it says, my enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They've pierced my hands and feet. Now again, you're listening to this. If you're not totally paying attention, maybe you're saying, I get it. It's the crucifixion story. We get it. That was Friday. This is Easter. Let's move on. Like We're going to get to the empty tomb, right? We're going to get there. But I'm reading words that were written almost a thousand years before Jesus went to the cross. Psalm 22, read it for yourself. Almost a thousand years before Jesus went to the cross, it talks about piercing his hands and his feet. Verse 18 says, they divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. This is one of the most amazing prophecies about what what would happen a thousand years later when Jesus went to the cross and died a, a Roman death, that, you know, the execution by Romans, and this was... Roman civilization wasn't even around when Psalm 22 was written. So I'm sure as David is penning this, he's writing this, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words down, he's probably thinking, what in the world am I writing here? What is going on? But we have the benefit of hindsight, and we can read that and say, maybe God's word is true. Maybe God's word is worth paying attention to. Maybe God's word does have something to say for me today. And I believe it does. Now today we're gonna look at another prophecy. I just, that was just a bonus for you today, but we're gonna look at another one that's less well known, but still super, super powerful. But before we get to it, I just have a question for you this morning. How do you see Jesus? And what are you hoping for from him? I mean, we all kind of have a, a picture of Jesus in our mind. We all, we all have sort of a vision of Jesus or of God and and some people, maybe if you, if you come around here a lot, if you're a regular here at Alpine Church, maybe you'd have one answer to this. But some of you who, who maybe are a little bit less regular, you might, you might say, yeah, I, I probably see him differently now than I did before. I don't know. I, I, 
Maybe some of you are saying, I, I, I have some of my doubts. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure about Jesus. I'm not really sure what I believe about him. Yeah, you'll get dressed up. You'll put on the pastels once a year. Maybe a couple times a year you'll come to church. But I don't really know. I don't really know what I think about Jesus. Oh, oh and what do, I, what do I hope for from him? Oh, I don't know. I mean, maybe I would have hoped for a better job by now or better house by now or maybe finally a Tesla. Other people seem to have one of those, and I don't have one of those yet. Or, I, you know, my kids are fine, but maybe they could have turned out a little better. No offense, kids. You know, I think for, for so many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, now maybe you wouldn't say Jesus, this is what I'm hoping for from Jesus, but maybe you would say this is what I'm hoping for from God. Or, or maybe if you're not very religiously inclined, maybe you'd say this is what I'm hoping for from the universe. Like what are you hoping for? What do you, what do you want out of life? Now this is a really good question though for today's text. Again, we're working our way eventually toward the Easter story in Mark. We're going to get there, I promise. Mark 15. But before we get there, I want you to see, you know, I read Psalm 22, but I want you to see another prophecy that I think would really help us to understand how a Jewish person 2,000 years ago would have answered this question. How do you see the Messiah? How do you see the, the rescuer of our people What are you hoping for from the Messiah? Now, Messiah is kind of a Jewish term, but Messiah just means savior, rescuer. It's the the one that would come that the Israelites were hoping for and were yearning for, and for the longest time, they wanted this. And Jesus shows up on the scene 2,000 years ago, and, and so many of the early, so many of the Israelites at that time, so many of the crowds of people as we've seen over the over these last few months as we've been studying the Gospel of Mark, so many of the crowds of people were pressing in to see him and to know him, and they had expectations for him because they thought he was the Messiah. They thought he was the one who was gonna rescue the Israelites from Roman oppression, from Roman rule. And so Isaiah 64 really articulates this hope. This was written by the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament seven or 800 years before Jesus came. And it says this. It's kind of like a prayer to God. Isaiah writes, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Now, rend means rip, tear. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. And verse two says, As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. It kind of reminds me of something that James and John, a couple of Jesus' disciples, said to him when they were passing, a, passing by a town in Samaria and, and the town didn't let them come in. The town rejected the message of Jesus. And James and John said, Jesus, should we call down fire from heaven on them? This is what, this is what kind of, this was a, I don't know, like an Israelite thing. It's kind of like the fighting Irish. I'm Irish, so I can, I can really relate to this. It's like, it's like, can we pick a fight with these people? Maybe some of you have a little bit of road rage and you feel that way sometimes when you're driving down the road. Like, why are you driving so slow, right? My, my wife recognizes this in me. She's more sanctified than I am. And so she's just always like, Brian, just chill out. Just chill out, it's okay. No big deal. She knows that someday one of those people might have more rage than I do on the road. So some of you can relate to this. Like, yeah, I want to get in a fight. This is what Isaiah is saying. I want to get in a fight. Like, God, we want you to open the heavens and make yourself known to these oppressors. Make yourself known to our enemies. Make yourself known to the world that doesn't know you. We know who you are. At least we think we know who you are. But why why aren't things going better for us? We're your special people. Why aren't things going better for us? So rend the heavens and come down and and let the mountains tremble before you and and bring some some hurt to the nations who don't know you. Reveal yourself in this way. And then Jesus shows up. And we saw this a couple of months ago when we started reading Mark chapter one and the first fulfillment of the Isaiah prophecy is right here at the baptism of Jesus 
Verse 10, it says, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water in his baptism, he saw heaven being torn open. Remember, oh, that you would rend the heavens and show yourself. And here Jesus is getting baptized and his ministry is just starting. And heaven is torn open. The heavens are rent. And what happens is the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove and a voice from heaven, the voice of God, the voice of God the Father said, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And so I I would imagine that some people that day at the baptism of Jesus were thinking about Isaiah 64. Some some of them that day, some of the more zealous Israelites that day were thinking, this is it, this is Isaiah 64. The heavens are rent and God is finally going to show himself. He's finally going to reveal himself like everyone's going to get to see what he's really like. And remember, the Israelites wanted, wanted the pagan nations to see his judgment. They wanted the pagan nations to see his wrath. We're all good with God showing his wrath on other people, right? No, none of us want to see his wrath firsthand, but we want to see it on someone else. Because there's always, if you haven't learned this yet, there's always someone a little bit worse than you. Thank God for that. There's always someone a little bit worse than you. And so when we're like, yeah, God's going to judge people. Well, where's the line? Well, uh, it's look, here, here I am. The line's over here. I just made the cut. But God, I wish you would judge all those other people. That's kind of the, that's, that's kind of how many of us are wired. And, and so I imagine there were some zealots that day at the baptism of Jesus opening up the scroll to Isaiah 64, saying, this is it, this is it, here he is, here's Messiah, he's gonna come and deliver us, he is gonna open up a can on the Romans. You thought I was gonna finish that? (laughs) But here's what we've learned as we've studied this over the last few months. I wanna just give a little, little bit of a summary for those of you who have missed it. And for those of you who've been around, this, is, this will just be a good little refresher. Here's a sampling of Jesus' ministry. He healed a leper. So this leper, this, this person who had this incurable disease, a disease that by law would make him say to people, unclean, I'm unclean. If, they, if you were to come close to a leper, you would, the leper by law had to say, I'm unclean. Stop. The leper had to warn you and tell you. You can't come any closer because it was so contagious. Lepers had to live as pariahs in a colony outside of the community. They couldn't even be in contact with the rest of the community because of their leprosy. And this leper was so desperate for healing. Could you imagine living with that disease for that long? This leper was so desperate for healing that he hunted Jesus down, breaking the law to come in contact with the people around Jesus. There were always crowds around Jesus. And the leper comes to Jesus and says, if you are willing, you can heal me, which is such an interesting thing to say. What he was saying was this, I know you can do it, I just don't know if you want to do it. And who can blame him for an attitude like that, right? I mean, he'd lived his whole life as a pariah. I know you can do it. I've heard about your miracles. I know that you're powerful. I know that you're Messiah. I know you can do it. I just don't know if you will do it. It's so much easier to believe in the greatness of God than it is to believe in the goodness of God. We all have a sense, I think it's just kind of innate in all of us, that we have a sense that God is holy and far and there's something bigger than all of us. But we don't all necessarily have the sense that God is near, he's among us, he wants to, he wants to touch us and that's just what Jesus did. Jesus touched the leper, he said, I am willing Three of the most powerful words in the Bible, I am willing. It shows us the heart of God. And he touched the leper. He didn't have to touch the leper. I mean, he created the whole world by speaking it. He could have just spoken it. There are other miracles in the the Gospel of Mark where Jesus just speaks it and it happens. But he didn't just speak it this time. He touched the leper because he wanted to show the heart of God. He wanted to rend the heavens and reveal God to the people. And this is what he revealed. He revealed a God who's willing and who's willing to touch a leper, who has the power to do it, but more than that, has the heart to do it. And then in another scene, we saw that Jesus forgives a paralytic. These four friends bring this paralyzed guy 
to Jesus and the house that Jesus was preaching in was so packed that they had to literally break a hole into the top, the roof of the house, and lowered him before Jesus, right in the middle of Jesus' sermon. And, and he's brought before him, and Jesus looks at him, and he, and he says something that nobody expected. Nobody in the whole room expected. He said, your sins are forgiven. And could you imagine that? You're like, hey, Jesus, read the room here. That's not what I'm here for. <laughs> Thank you for that, but that's not what I'm here for. No, but, but I think what it shows us is that Jesus sees our deepest need. A lot of times we only know the surface needs, but Jesus sees our deepest need. And our deepest need, your deepest need isn't financial, it's not relational, it's not emotional. I know there are people in here who have all those needs. Your deepest need is spiritual. And Jesus sees this paralyzed guy and he said, your sins are forgiven, and that created quite a stir because the religious elite were there and they're saying, you can't, you don't have the power to do that. Who do you think you are? You don't have the power to do that. And Jesus said, okay, well, to prove that I have the power to do this. He looked at the guy and he said, get up, take up your mat and walk. And he did. That guy walked out of there that day. And Jesus showed that he had the power to heal. But more than that, he, had, he showed that he had the power to forgive. Okay, so now we're starting to really see who Jesus, oh, that you would rend the heavens and show yourself so he's good, he's kind, he's gracious, he's loving, but he has the power to forgive sins. And then we saw as we continued to study that Jesus invited scum to follow him. Now those weren't his words, by the way. <laughs> Jesus wasn't like, hey scum, come on over, you can follow me. No, those were the words that the religious elite used. The religious elite were like, why do you invite scum to follow you? What, why do you invite all these losers to follow you? tax collectors and fishermen, regular Joes, regular guys. Why, would you, why, why wouldn't you invite more educated people? Why, would, why wouldn't you invite more powerful people? And Jesus, again, he's rending the heavens. He's revealing God to people. And I want you to hear this, because maybe your vision of God is wrong. Maybe how you view God is a little bit off. I want you to hear this. God is interested in regular people. God is interested in Average people, God is interested in sinners. He's interested in scum. Some of you might come on a Sunday to a church like this and you're like, I'm just a little bit nervous. I'm not sure what's gonna happen when I walk through those doors. Because if God only knew where I've been this year, if God only knew about the skeletons in my closet, I'm not sure he'd invite me well, if that's your attitude, I don't think you quite have the right picture of Jesus. Because when, when Jesus revealed himself, he revealed, he revealed a God who wanted to reach regular people, even sinners. In fact, he said, I haven't come to call those who think they're righteous. I've, called, I've come to call those who know they're sinners. I mean, think about that. That's like the exact opposite of what you think about when you think about church-going people. Church-going people are righteous people. That's who should be going to church. No, no, Jesus said, I didn't call those who think they're righteous. I called those who know they're sinners. So if you're here today and you feel just a little bit uncomfortable, that's good. That's a good sign because if you know you're a sinner, join the crowd and we're the ones that Jesus wants a relationship with. This is why the heavens were rent and Jesus came down. And we see Jesus just all throughout chapter two, Jesus was challenging the religion police. The relig Everyone knows the religion police, right? The, the holier than thou people, the people who are always pointing fingers. My dad always said, when you point a finger, just be aware there are three more pointing back at you. See that? See that? The problem is my dad pointed like this. He's like, that's why I point like this all the time. <laughs> and his fingers are all like gnarled up from softballs. He's like, this is how you should point at people. So no fingers are pointing back at you. He always had a, a way to get around stuff like that. But that's what a religion police would do is just point the fingers all the time. They wouldn't ever look at the hypocrisy in their own heart. They were always pointing it out in other people. And, and Jesus challenged them. Jesus didn't let that kind of stuff go. He challenged them because it made him angry that they were supposed to be revealing the heart of God to the people and they were doing the opposite. 
They were hiding the heart of God from people. They're reading scriptures. They're experts on the Old Testament. They're experts on the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. But they miss the whole heart behind it. And that's why Jesus came down. He came down to reveal God's real heart to the world. And he challenged the religion police. And really, at the end of the day, he preached good news, not bad. Remember, Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down and and light the world on fire. Oh, that you would bring judgment to all the people who don't know you, God. I want you to reveal yourself, and I want you to open up a can on the world, on the pagan world. And instead, Jesus came down, and he brought a message of hope and healing and forgiveness and good news I want you to hear that today if you're here. And again, if your vision of God, if your picture of Jesus is, is something else, I, I want you to hear today that, that Jesus came to bring good news, not bad news. Now, we're not even at the Easter story yet. This was only the, the first prophecy when Jesus, Jesus gets baptized and the heavens open up and we start to see the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, we see the first fulfillment of the Isaiah 64 prophecy, but it's not until Good Friday that we see the second fulfillment of the Isaiah prophecy, and here it is, Mark chapter 15, verses 37 and 38. Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he's about ready to breathe his last. It says he uttered another loud cry and breathed his last, and look at what happens. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. There's that word again. At Jesus' baptism, the heavens are torn open. And at Jesus' death, the curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. And that's significant. This is the second fulfillment of Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and show yourself. This is the ultimate picture. This is the ultimate revelation of the heart of God is when Jesus went to the cross and died and the moment he died, that temple curtain, the the temple curtain was described for us in Exodus 26, way back in the Old Testament. I wanna make sure you know what that means because there's significance here that I, I don't want you to miss. These were the instructions given to Moses about that temple curtain for the inside of the tabernacle Make a special curtain of finely woven linen and hang the inner curtain from clasps. Put the Ark of the Covenant, you know, from Indiana Jones? <laughs> that one, yeah. Put the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it. And this curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. See, the, the, temple, was, the temple was all about helping the people to understand how holy God is. And so there were the outer courts where just about anyone, anyone Jewish could hang out. And then there were the inner courts. And then there was the holy place. And then there was the most holy place. And the most holy place is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And the Ark of the Covenant was so special because that's where the presence of God was said to dwell. If you want to know in the Old Testament where was God's presence, it was right there in the most holy place on the on top of the Ark of the Covenant, that's where God's presence dwelt. And that's, it was so important, it was so powerful, it was so scary that only once a year on the Day of Atonement, you can read about it in Leviticus 16, once a year, only one guy, the, the very high priest, the most important priest of all the priests, only that guy, once a year, in fear and trembling, could go past the curtain into the presence of God to say, God, we're sorry for all of our sins this year. And that was part of how they had to do it. And boy, it was, they, had, they would like wrap a rope around him because if somehow he screwed something up, if somehow he forgot to cross his T's or dot his I's, God's presence would smite him and he would be dead and he would lie dead and nobody could go in there to get him. That's why they put a rope around his ankle. That'd be kind of nice, right, if you're the priest, like, Remind me, why are you guys doing this? We'll let you know later. (laughs) If he died in the presence of God, they would just pull him out. They would drag him out. We'll try again next year. That curtain, that curtain separated the, the holy place from the most holy place. That curtain represented no access. 
you have no access. You can't, you can't know God. You can't be with God. You can't have relationship with God. And that's why it's so powerful that when Jesus breathed his last, the, the veil, that, that curtain tore from top to bottom. God's the one who tore that. It tore from God's end down to our end. And that curtain was removed, which signified access to God for all of us. Later on in the New Testament, the author of Hebrews describes it so perfectly. He says this, Hebrews chapter 10, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. We don't have to stand out there and be afraid anymore. We don't have to wonder if we can have access to God, to this holy and scary God. It says, by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, it's talking about Jesus now. Jesus is our high priest now. We don't need any other high priest. But since we have Jesus, let us go right into the presence of God. And think about just how powerful this statement was. For a Jewish person who all their life thought about God as inaccessible, and what the author of Hebrews is saying is that we have access now into the most holy place. People would have said, how? That was off limits before because the temple veil was torn in two. And so let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. And this next part's really interesting. For our guilty consciences, who doesn't have a guilty conscience? For our guilty consciences, have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. That's so cool. So when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was torn in two. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and make yourself known. And Jesus died on the cross. He breathed his last, and the temple veil was torn in two so that God would make himself known. Not just one time, but we can know God all the time. We can have a relationship with God all the time. We can open his word and know him more every day. We can go to small group or, or, or meet with a mentor. We can do family devotionals. We can come to church every week and we can know God. We can know God. We don't have to be afraid anymore. We don't have to wonder if he wants to reveal himself. He's revealed himself. He's not holding anything back anymore. The heavens have been rent. And the whole reason is because Jesus died and rose again. It's so important to know that Jesus rose again because if we weren't celebrating Easter, then we wouldn't be celebrating anything because if Jesus, if Jesus breathed his last and died and stayed dead, then, then this wouldn't be true. We would have no hope. And so let's finish today with that story from Mark 16. Three days after that temple veil was torn, the some of the women disciples entered the tomb and they saw a young man, an angel clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And the women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. And I love what he says here at the end. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter. Peter gets called out because if you know Peter's story, he was so ashamed because he denied Jesus three times. He followed him for three years and then he denied him three times the night he died. And I love what the angel says, go tell his disciples, including Peter, he's still his disciple. Jesus forgives him. We get it. He doesn't have to live in shame anymore. He doesn't have to have a guilty conscience anymore. Because that temple veil was torn in two. And even Peter, even Peter can continue to follow Jesus. Maybe you're here today and, and when you asked that question today, when you were answering it, how do you see Jesus? Maybe, maybe you just see him as this, kind of like almost the religion police. Maybe that's how you see Jesus as this, it's kind of this scary God who's just like, you screwed up again. You screwed up again. But that's not the heart of God toward us because of the cross. Jesus went to the cross. He took on all that guilt and shame. 
and he nailed it to the cross and then he rose from the dead to prove that it doesn't have to have control of us anymore. And that is how God revealed himself. That is how the heavens were rent. It wasn't to show his judgment, it was to show his forgiveness and his love and his kindness that is found only in Jesus. And this is what we talk about every week at Alpine Church. And we sure would love to have you get to know this Jesus with us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are such a good God with such a beautiful plan. When we read the Bible from cover to cover, we just see this plan unfolding and it's shocking. And we read prophecies like Psalm 22 or, or Isaiah 64 and we say, God, you are, you are so good, you're so gracious, you're so forgiving. Thank you for revealing yourself ultimately at the cross and in the resurrection. And thank you for what you revealed, that you're a good God, that you're a gracious God, that you're a loving God. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to know that God. Lord, I pray for the person who's here, whether it's a young person or, or an older person, God, whether they come every week or they just come every, every so often to church, God, I pray that you would open their eyes, that you would drop the veil from their eyes so that they can see who you really are that you would reveal your true nature to them even today and we'll celebrate you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.